Hello, James. Happy Sunday. Welcome to the Grand Slam Journey podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Of course, it's my pleasure. And I'm so curious to dive into your journey, being a competitive athlete, and now helping athletes transition from their athletic dreams and pursuits of their athletic goals to perhaps the second chapter of their lives, careers, through franchising. And so I have uh, quite a bit of bias, obviously, from my own experience being a former athlete, but also now as I interview other athletes transitioning to the next chapter of their lives. So I am curious to hear about all of that guidance and let's see what else we uncover along the way. But I want to give you an opportunity to introduce yourself to the listeners. Thank you. Yeah. So I uh, was a minor league uh, baseball player in the uh, Phillies uh, Philadelphia Phillies uh, system. Uh, I was there in uh, very briefly because I came right out of high school into a camp. And while in minor league camp, I uh, I hurt my shoulder and that pretty much ended my uh, professional career um, habit of, mm -hmm. of, uh, of playing. So then it was like, okay, well, what do I do from there? And I kind of got into the restaurant business and uh, took took a good uh, loving to it and worked my way up in the restaurant world. I came, I uh, was in, involved in a, uh, a fast food company where I worked in their, the quick service market for 25 years. And then another company came to me and said, hey, we need someone to run our franchise operations, supporting our franchisees, uh, running our operations. Could you do that? Uh, I said, absolutely. Jumped at that chance. And I, I went from uh, we went from having one store all the way up to a hundred stores uh, that we built the chain up to. So that was fun and great and a great time supporting um, different franchisees. Then the largest franchisee of the company came and said, hey, work, come work and partner with us. And that happened to be owned by two NFL football players. So we did our restaurants that we had. Then we did our own um, our other franchise of a of an ice cream sandwich, a Bake Bear franchise. Then we did our own coffee concept as well as our own um, cookie dough concept. Then one of the NFL players, he um, retired. He went into the um, movie business and because and, he, he was a writer, children's book writer and whatnot. And then the other brother got hurt, couldn't fulfill the end of his contract. And he and his brother said, hey, we're going to do this joint venture. We're going to go into the tequila company. We're going to start. We're going to start our own tequila company. At that point, I, I, I didn't really want to join them. I, I, I don't have anything against tequila, but just because it wasn't really my forte or my background and my strengths. And then I decided I would go be a franchise broker of matching uh, not only athletes, but professionals of different opportunities that are out there in business. Because in professional world, corporate America is tough and they'll turn their back on you in a, in a minute and put you out on the street. So you know, I wanted to help those people find a, a great match and, and something they can do, as well as the athletes, uh, definitely the athletes, because I did see all the different people that would come up to the brothers that were in the NFL with these crazy schemes of to invest in this, invest in that. And you know, I, I always saw that many athletes just get pushed and pulled in different ways. And I just wanted to be able to, where they could come and just get an honest opinion of, hey, I'm not really selling anything. I'm just showing you your options that are out there. And let's go on this journey together and find a great fit. Uh, that will that will not only you know make you money, but could you know provide uh, generational wealth for for you. So um, that's kind of why I got into it, and I, I really just love what I do because at the end of the day, it is um, helping and changing people's lives. I love that overview, and I want to dive a little bit more first into your journey before we transition to all of that franchising world that you had described beautifully. Um, I'm always curious how my guests find their first passion. And it's interesting that we as athletes cling to one sport versus the other. So you mentioned you played baseball. If you reflect back, what was it that attracted you to the sport and why baseball? What attracted me to the sport was just uh, the ability to be with the team, that you, you have teammates, you're relying on teammates. It's a great thing, but also, the individual aspect of it when 
you could come up to the plate and it's just you against the pitcher uh, that, that's there. So you you have a it's like an individual sport and a team sport all involved together and just the uh, the pace of the game and just knowing that there's no clock so that, that you know we're, we we have you know 27 outs and that we we have all those outs and we're not going to run out of time so i i really just uh, love the uh the base passion of, of the sport of baseball and then i just really just remember as a kid growing up i had a i had a brick wall in my front yard and i had a baseball and all i would do is throw that baseball against that wall and field it and just uh uh, just for hours on to hours from sun up to sundown, just working on fielding and throwing. And that just became a passion of mine. And I love you describing as such in the word passion. I often feel, even from my own experience, when we say the word, it can be hard to describe to others. So can you go just a little bit deeper of Baseball, was there anybody who inspired you or what did your upbringing look like? Again, any of the underlining things behind the passion that you want to fill uh, fill in that made you realize maybe some of the first times why you love this game and the sport? Yeah, well, I I did watch my older brother play. He played um, center field and and he wore, he wore number nine. So then it was like, okay, well, when I play, I'm going to wear number nine. And and uh, just from that, and then my dad would come home and throw the ball around. And then, you know, he, he uh, we had a fairly uh, decent size, uh, you know, we lived on an acre. So my dad uh, designed it and, and built a, uh, you know, batting cage. So now, you know, I was out front playing with the, the ball against the wall, but I would go in and, uh, hit off a tee and, and uh, just hit. And, and when, I, when I go by passion, it was basically I couldn't wait for the sun to come up and to be able to go out and either hit or throw the, throw the ball around. And uh, it, it just was like I, I hated it when it got dark. It's, then I couldn't, you know, couldn't do it. But then, you know, I, it was just uh, something that I always loved. And even as a kid, I mean, now it's, you know, the Internet's out. But, you know, I couldn't wait to do to to get that uh newspaper and read the box scores of baseball and just dive into the stats and how are these guys doing and and uh, I do remember also going and getting the sporting news at that time was was a magazine that came out weekly and uh it, it had a writer for every uh, major league baseball team in there and I would just read it hoping to pick up for they would say you know talk to major league baseball players and say i adjusted my stance or i did this to get out of my slump so i would process all mm -hmm. that and go "Ooh, that sounds neat i'll try that so it was i, I just dove, dove myself into the game and and just and just uh, researched it and and got anything that i could out of it i love you mentioning the researching and reading papers i also remember when i was Still playing tennis early on, the only thing you could read is the magazines. There wasn't obviously all the content that is now and YouTube and social media. So you got your hands on anything around the sport that you could learn from back then. It's funny how the world has changed. I always ponder like all of the information we have now at hand when it comes to how to train, how to recover, how to eat properly, the mind-body connection to maximize the performance how would my training look different if I had this information that we have now, Dan? But anything else you want to call out specifically? How do you reflect on that, James? I can't tell you enough how like, that's really a, a eight breathing. <laughs> and, and just it was all about baseball. That was it. That was that was my sport. That's what I dove into. And it's, you know, it's funny what you said, too, about looking at now all the data, all the analytics and all that, you know, when I was growing up, it was, you got to be, you know, it's a line drive, you got to be a line drive hitter. That's what you got to do. And, you know, home runs an accident. That's okay. And you didn't want to strike out. And now it's like, launch angle and strikeouts are all okay. And just like, wow, you know, if I, I, if I could have hit that, you know, if I would have known about this back in the day, yeah, I would have, I would have done launch angle then and, you know, uppercutted the ball. And it's just, it is just amazing of all the uh, analytics and stats of being able to train. And like you said, recovery, I really injured myself because I really didn't warm up properly. I just, I was always the guy that went out and just started chucking the ball. I didn't, I didn't really stretch, get loose. It was just always, 
I just started chucking the ball, chucking the ball. And of course, when you're doing your, it, with the team, you're doing your stretching and all that. But, you know, I got to be honest, it really wasn't serious about my stretching. It was just kind of going through the motions. And just I just wanted to pick up that ball and start throwing it. And uh, yeah, it, all the data we have and just the recovery and just, the, it would just been amazing to have all that information back then. And you mentioned injury. Maybe let's dive into that sad part uh, that eventually made you quit your baseball career. Personally, I think it's it's very hard thing as well. Um, that's one of the reasons why I knew after college I couldn't continue. My body just wasn't working the way it needed to. So there's that reality. If I can't perform the way I need to, it's also very frustrating because you know you have Uh, so many things that are bringing you down and then that impacts your mentality as well because you know you can't perform the sport to the degree that you would want to or you were able to because of those injuries. So specifically shoulder, how did you deal with that or what what actually happened to your shoulder? The tore uh, rotator cup. So it was like a, you know, threw a ball and it was like a knife, just like my whole shoulder blade, just like it exploded and uh, was just a very painful. And back at that time, really, the only player who would ever come back from that was Larry Heisel. So it was really just not something that was going to come back. And really, to be honest with you, after I had that, I, I grew up in a very little town. So I was this big fish in this, you know, little pond. And, and you know, when I got out into, you know, minor league camp and everything, I looked around and I said, wow, everyone's good. Like, oh my gosh, I, I couldn't believe the athletes and how good they were. So, you know, it, my confidence was already waning to begin with and uh, to to try to adjust through that. And um, it's just, it just, you know, it did teach me a lot going through that of just the mind and, and just like how you can lose your confidence and be so good mm-hmm. at something, work your whole life for, and then you know, just have like a, a couple bad weeks and just going, man, is, can, can I do this? And you try harder and harder. And, you know, I mean, I, I got hurt. And I also go, gosh, if I didn't get hurt, you know, could I, could I mentally have got myself out of this and, and, and been successful doing it? And I really don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. And so talk to me a little bit about that transition. How have you dealt with that and that transition to the restaurant business? How how has that path opened for you? In high school, I did have a job in a restaurant. It was a very it was mm-hmm. a fine dining restaurant um, that that uh, I just uh, I went from you know busboy waiting tables to expediter carrying food out, uh, bar back uh, helping bartenders, and uh, so when when I got hurt and I, I came back home and. And just decided, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I want to play ball again, but I don't really think I, I'm, I want to go back in and, and try. Cause at that point, I knew being hurt, I, I was going to have to lollipop the ball. I was going to be able to throw it once I heal, but I would never be able to throw it like I, yeah. I could. And uh, so I, I just went back to that restaurant. And then I just started learning more. I had a couple of people take me under their wings and going, Hey, you ever thought about getting into management and just, uh, working that way and and I was like yeah yeah sure that sounds good and then really what I what I really kind of really kind of like a light bulb went off it's like you know if I'm a manager I have employees but you know really I have a team so now I have my own team and if I'm a manager how am I going to manage this team well I'm going to manage it as if it was a baseball team you know, I'm going to have my cleanup hitter. You know, I'm going to have my number three hitters. I'm going to have my employees that maybe be my number nine hitters, my bench player, you know, employees that probably aren't going to get a lot of hours, but, you know, they're going to be valuable. So I really kind of developed the management philosophy of I'm going to manage as if, you know, the, my employees are my teammates. And we talked and we bonded as a team and we uh, always to me the biggest thing is communication in the business world and and that's kind of the way i i did i took my athletic background and just made my management style you know we're a team and we're going to teamwork we're going to have great communication we're going to have superstars we're going to have okay players and we're going to have bench players to this day that's kind of how i I've always managed. 
And if you don't mind asking, how old were you when somebody identified you had a management leadership? It seemed like it was quite early on after your transition from baseball. Yeah. So I was back. So I was, I was uh, 19, 20 years old, 19, 20 oh, wow. years old um, that they yeah. just said. And because I, again, I just always knew to, to work hard, perform, because as an athlete, you always want to perform. You always want to be the best. So I got into that restaurant. I was like, okay, I want to be the best bus boy I can be. What do I, you know, let me learn, like, let me watch the, the really pro bus boys and let me learn how to do that job better than they're doing it. So I kind of mm-hmm. just did that every station moving up. And, and then, uh, you know, again, the management philosophy, it's like, okay, I, I might not be on the, on the field anymore, but I am because this is my new team. Yeah. I love what you're mentioning and I'm drilling down because it reminds me so much of my own story. So I'm glad you're saying these words that I 100% resonate with. And what you're mentioning is this need of maximizing our, what, what I call now, maximizing my human potential, which is now kind of part of my mission. And I've, it's taken me quite a long time to reflect on. I actually, maybe I'm a slow learner because literally more than maybe a decade after I finished my tennis career, I realized that all the skills that I've learned through the sport are transferable. I think when you early, young, kind of going even through the transition from being brokenhearted that your athletic career is over, and especially when it ends in a way that your body is not allowing you to do it anymore, injury, etc. It can be really hard to envision what else beyond the sport you may enjoy, or at least it was for me. And so you, in some ways, sounded like you just kind of took a path that opened up for you. It was the restaurant business. You knew it a little bit from before. So you said, well, why don't I try it again? And then follow that path and someone identified that high potential in you and seemed like was able to be a mentor and a guide from early on to kind of help you see the world differently. Is is that accurate? What do you want to add, James, to that and kind of that transition path? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. That's, that's exactly right. Someone was there, mentored me. And then, you know, the, the crazy thing was it was, again, we, it was a very fine dining restaurant and, and uh, we, it was, I spent another couple of years management there, maybe two, three years. And from there I went into that a fast food company, which was completely different and opposite uh, of, of that. But it, it, again, the same thing there. I just, uh, Went there and and they put me in their management program right away. Uh, same different philosophy. Hey, now now it was it was a you had to be a little bit more quicker than you did in fine dining, and you you you, you still had to perform, of course, but it, it was I had to be you know, faster uh, on my feet and thinking, and it really wasn't that hard of a hard of a, a transition. But again, I I had people there that just saw. You know, I, I think it, and I really do, I attribute it to um, being an athlete of just saw, you know, nose to the ground. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to try to be the best at whatever, whatever station you put me in, I'm going to try to do the best. And that's kind of, I, I think everyone saw that and, you know, work my way up to general manager. Then, um, so it saw the potential there of being, you know, a top rated general manager to area director of now having just 10 restaurants of, of people that, uh, you know, I oversaw up to regional manager. Then when I went on to be in a, you know, franchise uh, director at the, uh, the other one. So it just, it basically is just that drive, I think, of, of competing and, and just that competitiveness to be the best that you can be that kind of propelled me and, and uh, led to uh, my success. Mm-hmm. And one thing I want to dive into specifically is the passion versus this opportunity to open up. I'm going to do it. Like if you reflect back at the beginnings of the restaurant business, and again, you're in the time you can't play baseball anymore because of the injury. This is sort of the path that's open up for you. Was it something that at that point you could imagine yourself continuing to do? I guess I'm trying to compare it the passion you had for baseball early on versus then the transition. Did you felt any passion early on in the restaurant business or did it sort of ignite later as you continue to get more experience in that field? 
I think it was the passion um, that, that I had for the restaurant business. And I say I think that because it was something easy that I could go back to do. Now, looking back on it, if I would have went into maybe a different uh, different industry, could I say that that would have been a passion and I would have been successful? Yeah, I probably would have. It definitely was a passion to do what I could do best. And uh, yes, of course, I love the restaurant business. But you know, why did I love the restaurant business? Because uh, early on, I just got that sports to it of, hey, I have a team now. I have a team now. You know, in another industry, would it, would it have been the same? You know, I, I, I would think probably, but that was really the first industry I went back into and something I applied and that just something that uh, came up and, and doors opened up for me. So yeah, I, I guess I would say, yes, it was definitely a passion for uh, restaurants, but you, you look back on it and go, gosh, why did I spend all that time in the restaurant business? What if I would have done this? So um, it, it is... Uh, it is different, that's for sure. What I'm hearing also is that you, in some ways, gamify it. And what I mean by it is that you found a way to make it fun and enjoyable. And it seems like that progress and getting better at something you didn't know, you're able to focus on how you can excel in that position that you're at, which is literally what athletes have to do and if you're in a game and things aren't going the way you want them to be if you're going to be upset and negative it's not going to help you so you're always trying to figure out how do I focus on the things that are important and make the best of what I have at hand or try to get myself out of this let's say bad day timing and figure it out through your mind and athletic skills, how to, again, turn the game in a different way and create a better outcome. So that it, it seems like that mindset skill was something that you, in many ways, applied even early on in the restaurant and sort of the business profession that you uh, were pulled into. Is that accurate? A hundred percent. And just like you're saying, you know, you're, you're going to have days where you have wins um, at work in the restaurant business, you're going to have days where you have losses where, you know, the didn't show up in time to open the store, got behind and we played catch up all day. And, and uh, you know, we, we did the best we could, but it wasn't the best of best of days, but but we survived it. And you know what? Tomorrow will be a new day and a new game. So that's just kind of how you have to look at it. Turn the page and and look for for better days the next day. But it, it was it was definitely that competitive and athlete training that, uh, you know, made it go. And you're absolutely right. That is something I took and just applied it into, you know, really all phases of my life, really. And I also find hindsight is always smarter. Like if I now look at my, you know, trajectory and career, I've built what I call my second current business and technology. I can definitely relate even the drive and focus I had put in into this building up the second profession. I was like, oh, tennis didn't work out. What can I be great at? What's the next thing I can put at least 10 years worth of time and effort to become great at something? And I didn't find it as a differentiator because it's just so hard when you add that spot in that time to mm -hmm. reflect on, on it accurately. But you're actually now enabling, number one, because of your own experience and journey and even your experience of working with amazing athletes, helping them build this business after. It seems like you have so much more views and experience helping them guide and understand how valuable that is, the skills they have learned through their sport and what they can apply them to. So tell me a little bit more about that. What are you seeing? Because you are coaching, obviously, athletes and former athletes, but also non-athletes in building franchising business. If you can, bucketize it. What are some of the differences that you're seeing, if you're seeing any? Maybe not, but. Well, yeah, one thing, too, that, that you were talking about, sure, is you know, in franchising, there's many different industries. So you know, obviously everybody thinks, well, franchising is just food in the restaurant business. Uh, that's really not true. I mean, it's in every industry mm -hmm. from dog grooming, pest control, uh, uh, window washing to, you know, uh, even used car lots. There's a franchise for it to car painting, you know, kids swimming. I could go on and on and on. So there's all these industries of, 
of franchising in there. And one thing that's really strong with an athlete, and, and I tell them, it's like, you know, you may not want to go into uh, the restoration business and know nothing about it, but it is something to where you don't need to know that. The franchise is going to help you. They're going to give you a playbook how to do this. You follow the playbook all your life. It's going to be natural to you. And you're running a business. So you're not going to be working in the business. You're going to be working on the business. So you're going to be you know, the that person pulling the levers and, and moving everybody around. So just rely on your natural instincts. And let's pick an industry that is going to fit for you depending on you know, what they're looking to get out of business ownership and something that you think is going to be, you know, very uh, fun and something that's going to excite you. Let's find that industry and let's let's look at some really good franchises in that industry. So how can you help distill what they're passionate about? It seems like you probably have a process for it, even just kind of hearing your story and athletic focus. You probably have your own ways how to help a person recognize what they may or may not be a fit for. Um, what do you want to share about that, James? And any tips from, again, your experience that help people understand what may be their appetite to entering franchise, and again, focusing on the area? Because I don't know if people can imagine maybe the breadth of franchise opportunities that there are. Yeah. So first we, we do, we talk about all the industries that are out there. Um, and of course, uh, most athletes are going to say, well, I want health and wellness. I want to, want to own a gym. So those are right. Those are right. At the top. And we, we can talk about what's in there and we talk about kind of why people want that. I and mean, then we go, we talk about investment level and go, Hey, this one franchise, uh, you know, so a lot of them come and want restaurants too. And being a restaurant guy, this is going to sound weird, but I really don't recommend that because you got to have a really strong team behind you. And if you're just one person, it's going to be the highest investment level out there. That most restaurants, you're talking half a million up to a million dollars or more. So it's a very high investment level uh, and, and very uh, small margins too, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I would much rather put you in something uh, like dog grooming that's, you know, 200k all in and and uh you're going to make probably more per unit than you are in a restaurant so but then again there might be they might just go ah, that's what i want james and i try to talk them you know just talk them through it and then at the end of the day they still want a restaurant then we'll do we'll find the best one that we can put them into so mm -hmm. we definitely do we talk about industries most athletes are going to want um, passive models they don't really want to be the ones in the business, you know, they want to hire a manager to do the day to day. So we talk about that, and then we we said we do we talk about investment level because that's they they have to be comfortable with the investment, and then we we start drilling down of of the industries and try to find uh, where it's passionate. Often, more times than not, someone will come in, they'll go, you know, I really want a gym. And then we talk about the different industries and we, I show them different things. And, you know, then they, next thing you know, they're signing a uh, three-store deal to do, to do a dog grooming business. So it's just, it's just finding that, uh, you know, just that fit and just showing them their options. And so a lot of people don't even realize, wow, there's a dog grooming, there's a franchise. So it's, it is, uh, and that's, what's really rewarding about the showing the different options that are out there, the different industries in the franchise world. And then, you know, the, the other thing too, is just telling that athlete or person of, you, you may not know that they're, they're going to give you a playbook. You're going to understand that. But for an athlete, that skill set is just, you know, I don't know if I can do this. Like you're around teammates all your life. The franchisor is going to be like your, your manager, your, your general manager. Right. And then, you're going to be a franchisee. So you're going to have different franchisees that are going to be in the same system. So they're going to be your teammates. So you're going to call them up for advice and, and, uh, and, and they're going to help you through uh, the business world as well. So an athlete really fits really great into the entrepreneur spirit uh, and, and franchise business because the hardest thing for a professional that's exiting corporate America to do, the hardest thing for a professional to do is to take that risk, is, is to bet on themselves and, and go out there on, out on their own and just, uh, and just take that leap of faith and, 
that's the hardest thing for a a non athlete usually to the, to do to get into the franchise business. And so you're saying because you're we're programmed already to do it through the athletics because that's really what that world is. You work on yourself day in and day out for hours and months and years to perfect that skill. You know what it takes to take that same mindset and discipline and hard work and then transition it to the business and, and the ability to take risks from that on because you're already used to believing in yourself. Is that accurate? Kind of what I'm Correct. Hearing? Yeah, it, it yeah. really is. The athlete is used to that, used to that risk. And, and really it's that, like you're saying, that entrepreneur spirit is almost already there and programmed in you because it is your body that you, you are banking on uh, for all your life. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, to take that risk in the in the business world is is much easier. I mean, obviously, it's it's a risk, and and it's it's something that all people got, will struggle with. But the athletes usually are more more willing to take that that leap for sure. Yeah, even reflecting on myself, I actually didn't think I was as entrepreneurial as um, I think I am actually like. Somebody asks you a question, let's say, how entrepreneurial are you? And I always feel like there's a scale, right? Zero to hundred, like how do you answer that question? And so growing up um, in a small town, my parents had their own business. I've always seen how much they have to work around it. So I felt like owning your own business, you can never step away from it. It's so much time and effort. And so I felt the corporate path could be easier, although <laughs> not very much. And again, reflecting on the years I've put in, I've really put in the same amount of work, if not more than building my own business, which doesn't always pay off. Actually, there's times in corporate America where doing less is better than doing more. It depends what culture and what company and organization you're in. And so putting that effort into building your own business can be much more beneficial, obviously, because then you can dictate your own just ways of working, your vision and mission. Obviously, it will be driven in some ways by the franchise, but then you create that atmosphere within the team that you have. So on that note, you interacting with those athletes, what do you think they need most coaching in as you talk to them, do they see that connection and how well that mindset translates? Or is it more the finances? Or is it more helping them envision the future of why franchise versus some of the other options? What do you see they typically need most reflection on as they consider the transition or addition actually of this path to maybe some of their current active career still? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I would say really the the thing is that just to get that mindset of what's the vision going to be? Are we looking at one unit? Mm -hmm. Are we looking to grow to two to three units? Uh, let, let's kind of like vision plan this out because that is a big deal in looking for a franchise too because you want you want to look for a system if it's something that you want to grow into this franchise to where you have that open territory where you can get territory to where you can expand if you want to and you will look at something that's fairly easy to to expand um, that's out there so that that's kind of one of the big things to get that picture and then some of the athletes if you're dealing with um some of the uh more uh well-known athletes it is uh explaining the franchise world that hey it is it is a franchise it's your business and yes you're going to be you can put your people in there to run it you have to hire a great manager due to the, to do the day-to-day -day. um but you know at the end of the day, it's going to be on you to drive this business. You know, you're going to have to take an active part. You can't just throw your money at it and just turn your back away and, and walk away and think the money's just going to grow. You got to put your effort into it. You got to build a team and you got to, you got to look and run your business. It, it's just, you can't expect the franchisor to do it that, you know, some of the athletes will think, oh, that's what franchise system, the franchisor runs it. No, it's your business. You have to run it. And you have to pick your people and you have to run your people. So sometimes it's about, so I got to be a little bit more hands-on. So it's kind of guiding them in a little bit way of, hey, you know, follow the franchisor's playbook. And, and, you know, it's not just, I'm investing my money, I have the money and I'm just going to 
sign up and walk away and it's it, the business is going to do good. It, it, it doesn't work that way. And any specific things you would want to mention that you kind of highlighted one now, but athletes are typically not good at and like what comes to mind. I, I don't know if I want to stereotype, but even from my own experience, maybe learning the business acumen because many athletes don't necessarily take business or finance background degrees. A lot of them, as you mentioned, are interested in athletics. So is it the business acumen or are there specific areas that does it vary really widely based on athlete or are there any specific area that you're able to kind of highlight if there's one thing athletes should think about differently as they may enter sort of this franchising world, this would be the area that I would suggest to focus on. Every athlete's different because of their background. So it kind of mm -hmm. is, is a case to case kind of type deal uh, of where to strength is. But I think you hit it like maybe business acumen of, hey, this is kind of what you have to do. You have to set up a LLC uh, that, that you have, and then you're going to have to have someone to do the, the your, your accounting and the books. And uh, there's people to do that. That's not a problem. Or, you know, the franchise or will we'll sometimes help you do that and get you set mm -hmm. up. But it, it's, it's being able to take that coaching, which athletes typically take coaching really well and are able to follow the system. And, you know, that, that is one too that you, you do have to make sure. And I do tell the athletes, you know, you are going to have to fo follow the franchisor's uh, system. So, uh, you know, no, no, no diva showboating. Um, you, you got, you got to follow the, follow the plan, you know, the, you stick to the plan make the plan and stick to the plan and follow the plan. Um, and uh, just uh, just make sure that they're ready to take that step, follow the franchisor's plan, and then just learn and soak, be a be a sponge of the franchisor. Because in a franchise too, they give you ongoing support, and they give you your own their own typically your own dedicated uh, franchise coach that you can lean on heavily. And I suggest suggest you do that, and you and you. You listen to them and and let them teach you if you're lacking in in an area. And I want to specifically dive into the options, and maybe this also comes from my personal thinking about what additional things I would want to do now or later. I've been thinking about franchise, and I've had many people actually recently. I want to say in the past two three years, reaching out of kind of franchise coaches. Hey do you want to start a franchise? So it seems like there's there's a lot of people who sort of do that outreach and are wanting to or willing to kind of help guide you through that process. But I always thought about, well, what's the difference go, going with franchise versus what if I start my own business versus, let's say, angel investing? So I'm thinking about the three key options that comes to my mind, how athletes may want to enter some of the business realm and invest some of their money into that future. Any specific uh, things you want to highlight, James, the benefits of franchising? It seems like, again, you're, you're focused on the franchise, but anything that you want to um, speak about the differences of why that versus maybe the other two options that come to mind, or feel free to add other options. One yeah. typically always is real estate. I'm, I'm just going to you know invest in mm -hmm. my real estate properties. I'm just going to keep my money there. And there's Look, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I, mean, I would just suggest to diversify your portfolio. What I will tell you is if you have a real estate investment, I'm, I'm just talking, you know, one, it typically will not replace the income like a franchise business will. You're going to have that, you know, monthly income, that um, monthly revenue and, and all that to, to, for a real estate really to to produce that. I mean, it's more of a longer term play. You know, you're going to have to have quite a few properties to replace the income. And you know, there's going to be things that go wrong with the property that you're going to have to probably put all those profits back into it to fix something. So it can be very expensive. And uh, I, I really think that uh, it's it's very easy to get caught up as oh, you can never go wrong with real estate. And, uh, you know, we're just going to flip homes. In. That's really tough. I've talked to a lot of people that try it that really <laughs> lose all their money. It sounds easy, but it is not. So I would just caution on that. It's it's a long term play. It's more than just sitting around watching the money fly into your bank account for sure. Then you can also go well. Let's uh, let's just say I have this uh, 
I, I'm great at pest control. I, I don't need to go to a franchise to start a pest control. I'm just going to start ACE Pest Control and, and start it on my own. I, I don't want to have to pay those fees and all that. And, you know, in franchising, you do. You pay a one-time franchise fee up front, um, and then you pay royalties on top of that. I would just tell you this, yeah, you could you could start your own business. Uh, you won't probably have, well, you won't. You won't have that ongoing support. You won't have that business that has stubbed their toe all that have been many years that are facing problems that they've already faced the problems that are in your future, starting your own business. And you're paying those royalties for their expertise, their knowledge of, of equipment that's out there, their, um, their, their knowledge of how to you know set the business up, how to run the business, how to market the business. Not only that, you also have what we talked already talked about. You have franchisees in the system that are going to be your teammates that you can pick up the phone um, and and get advice from, as well as that franchise coach that you could pick. So I think I'd much rather partner uh, with a business partner for maybe five percent of of my top line sales uh, for the rest of my life. That would be my business partner, and instead of a fifty fifty business partner, it's your business partner. For five to eight percent of your your sales on your top line, so uh, I think that's a a, a win win on the franchise side of, of doing that rather than doing it on your own. And what I actually haven't considered, maybe fully until you said it now, is the support system and the ability to call the other indirect teammates that are part of the franchisee. Obviously, you have the playbook and franchise is sort of we've tested and validated and this is the proven thing what works for our business. So if you take this and replicate it and open the store or whatever you're opening in the right place, it should hopefully work if you just follow it, right? That's the premise of it. But also the ability to connect with additional people that I find is so valuable. And again, something I haven't been great at. Obviously, maybe the reason coming from individual sport, I've been very individual before and I've just focused, well, if I just do the job right, it should work. And in business and world is much more complex than that. I'm just now and maybe the past few years realizing the power of relationships and how important it is to be connected to other people, broader people, networking and sort of that part of it. And so the fact that the franchise already come with that sort of indirect team that you can then reach out to and could you strengthen or pick your people that you want to talk with and thrive in the business together, that seems like that would be a tremendous value and actually just kind of highlighting it now because I don't think I've considered it enough when somebody says franchise. I, it wasn't something that comes top of mind for me. And that's one of the things, if you don't really check into it, you don't really realize that it's not just the franchise or support. There's the, there's that other support that, that goes on out there with it. So it, it, and it can be very rewarding. And at the end of the day too, you know, what, what a lot of people don't realize is that it is your business. At the end of the day, yes, you're in a franchise system, but it is your business. So it's just like owning your business. You can sell that. Even though you have a 10-year term into your franchise contract, you can, you can after two years, say, yeah, pest control, I, I love it. It made me some good money, but I'm, I'm going to step out and maybe go get a different franchise. I'm going to sell my business. So you perfectly can sell your business just like you can sell um, any other business. So it, you're you're not uh, you're not hamstrung to stay in the system. You could exit it um, if you wanted to as well. And so your comment reminded me a little bit maybe of the myths. You talk to many different people. What are some of the common myths and misconceptions that you find James people have about franchising uh, that you think? this is not how the world works. Uh, maybe this is the way you should think about things. So one of the kind of general type things is you, you will get uh, people that, that will call us uh, and just go, you know, I was in this restaurant. It has a long line and I've seen that I could get one for 50,000. No, you know, the, the things that are out there, if it's saying 50,000, that's probably the franchise fee, but you have the build out it's going to be, could be 600K to a million dollars to build out this franchise. To really get into franchise ownership, it does uh, require some capital. I would say at least 50,000 of liquid cash and then the ability to get funding of to 100 or 200,000. And that, that could be done via the SBA loan. You also have the uh, 
401k where you can roll your 401k into and get a franchise. So there's different funding options, but it does require some capital to get into. There's no, you know, magic of uh, like a car where you can buy zero down and lease it. That that really kind of doesn't exist because the, the bank wants to have uh, skin in the game. You know, the bank can go get that car from you, but you know, they can't take uh, your, your business from you. They, it's, it's, it's harder to just loan that kind of money to, to do that for sure. So that, that definitely is one of the myths and, and just the myths that, uh, that are out there on, yes, it is your business you could sell. And one of the bigger restaurant chains out there where you can, they can build a, a block away from you. Uh, so they can they can just build and then you know franchises don't protect you they're just in it for fees and all that. No, really good franchises. That's why I always say work with the franchise broker because they can help you. Because those you have to read the FDD and it's all disclosed in there and you have to have some sort of protection. That's where you do your research of researching a really good franchise uh, that, that's out there of finding that. If you're, if you're looking at a franchise, you do your investigation, you, you, you should be okay to where you're not going to have anything. And the, the vast majority of all the franchises, typically, that they're, they're not just after you know, trying to grow and get as many franchisees in. They, they really want you to succeed because the last thing they want is unhappy franchisees in the system. Because when you want to buy one, and I'm telling you, hey, talk to my franchisees. If they're not happy, we're not selling any more of our of our business. So it, it, the franchisor, their interest is the franchisees all doing well. I like you highlighting, actually, it seems like also the win-win. So they're also looking for a match of somebody who actually wants to be in the business and wants to be successful at it, not just invest money for the sake of having business. On that note, any specific things you want to highlight when it comes to some of the perhaps more surprising options? I know you shared previously, a lot of athletes obviously resonate with like say gyms, the healthy lifestyle, et cetera, fitness. That can be also quite hard, I think, at least from my view to run. Restaurant business, that's super hard. I don't know how, why or how people want to have restaurants. I, I would personally never want to probably venture into that. Although I've heard how amazing Chick-fil-A is from a restaurant perspective for the franchise that they run. Uh, I'm sure it's quite expensive, but I think you want to call out specifically like some of the most surprising things that uh, you would say, well, this was really surprising. Athlete chose this specific area or things that even are quite popular. People don't know about, but have really good promise of making money. You gave an example of the dog grooming, but I don't know if there's any other areas maybe that people traditionally don't think about. Yeah, I mean, dog grooming definitely is is, is right up there for sure. Uh, another one of those that people really don't think about would be you know, home care, uh, senior senior care of, of um, seniors staying in their homes, of mm-hmm. you know, having a business that comes out to take care of the senior. So they, so mom and dad and grandma and grandpa can stay in their home to where, you know, some franchises, franchises have developed technology to where they can be seen on the TV of, you, you, the, of the senior and say, Hey, did you take your pills and, and just help with, with uh, just general, general things of day to day that they can help with. That's a, that's a, a another really good franchise out there. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, uh, different franchises, the health and wellness that pops up, there's the IV fluid drips, but also in the sports world, what's kind of popping up is indoor golf studios mm-hmm. of where you go indoors to practice golf. It's 24 seven access to the, uh, to the uh, um, customer. It's all automated where you don't need really any employees. I'm not talking of the huge top golf. I'm talking of a, uh, you know, four or five bay setup of, where you you're really it's it's a great passive model where you're only putting about ten to really truly ten to fifteen hours a weekend because it's all automated for you and it's it's a it's a great business and another one that's really kind of growing fast is I'm sure you probably play it or maybe you hate the sport but, um, it would be pickleball because um, yeah. you know there, there's a lot of pickleball fr- pickleball franchises are selling like crazy right now. So are they opening pickleball sort of clubs or what is the franchise around James? Yeah. So they, they open uh, pickleball clubs to where you, it's mm-hmm. indoors uh, yeah. to where you come in and play. So it's a couple of them. Some of them just have the courts. Other of them have a pickleball center, much like a top golf where you have yeah. the 
you know, the bar and a menu of, of a restaurant option and pickleball. So you have membership and then you have the junior event clubs and all that. So those are starting to really pop up and those are very popular that, that are out mm. there for sure. Some of the ones, uh, uh, ones that athletes really kind of chose that really was like, huh. So this one particular uh, basketball player, he chose a wedding dress franchise uh, where wow. they just sell wedding dresses. And turns out that he was really looking for it for his wife and his wife really loves fashion. So they wound up getting a, uh, a franchise that sells wedding dresses and, and doing uh, quite well. And then I had another, he was a minor league baseball player. He actually uh, picked a franchise that picks up dog poop. They go to houses, they pick up dog poop, they treat the lawn. So they, they do lawn treatment. They go out and do um, HOA cleanup for, you know, horse goose or, or dog, dog poop. And, and uh, it, it's, just, it was a, it was a very low entry. Like that fran that particular franchise is about um, $80,000 all in. So it was nice, affordable for him. And uh, he's doing very well doing it. So the, it, there's just many countless different things that are, that are out there that uh, uh, can be uh, can be investigated. That's for sure. Yeah, you have my mind going. Maybe I, we need a separate uh, call after this, James, to explore some franchising because some of the things you're stating are things I probably wouldn't envision. Um, and yeah, my problem is I get easily enthusiastic and passionate about many things, so I typically have to tame down my enthusiasm. Otherwise, there will be probably hundreds of things going on on my schedule at the same time. And then I'm disappointing myself because I can hold my commitments. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, um, I do see that sometimes we'll be looking at franchise options and I might show them five or 10 different options and they'll go, James, I like, I like five of these. I want to talk with the franchisor. And I was like, well, I wouldn't recommend talking to more than three at a time because then otherwise it's just so time consuming and then you're going to forget. Just focus mm -hmm. on your top three and let's yeah. and let's go after that. So I, I totally get what you're saying about being so excited that you kind of dive in and you you go a little bit overboard. So, yeah, that, that's something uh, that's a pitfall. You don't want to make a mistake of talking with 10 at one time. Oh, that's good. So it seems like more athletes have the same mindset. You probably deal with that on a regular basis. That makes me feel better, actually, that it's not just me. Thank you. Yes. I do want to uh, talk a little bit about the NIL. We touched on it during our conversation earlier. Obviously, it's something that didn't exist during the time that we were in college or playing sports. And I always wonder how it's shaping the younger demographic, I mean, one, it's fantastic. I'm all for it because I know how much time and effort goes into a sport. And so the ability for young athletes in the teens, 20s to be able to earn some extra money with the hard work and sort of build their name, I totally support. And at the same time, I also wonder how much burden and much more responsibility it adds to them. And if it removes a little bit of the fun out of the sport. Um, although maybe now, as I said, uh, I don't know, we we all athletes take the sport as serious as we can, at least the, the good ones. So maybe that's not an issue. Again, NIL is a opportunity to actually for the younger athletes then have and earn some money and then perhaps try to think early about diversifying and then going into that franchise early on, let's say in the 20s. One thing I often think about and reflecting on when I was younger, I don't come from sort of generation wealth. So I had to learn on my own the money and financials world, right? But the compounding interest, if you start investing money early on, how much more money you can have later. So the sooner you can start, the better. And the sooner you can start your own business again in your 20s, then you have maybe like a decade, 10 or 15 years that put you already maybe in like 30s or 35 to have like an awesome additional bunch of money you can then invest again. How are you seeing that world or activity in the NIL type of athletes when it comes to some of the franchising opportunities? I'm starting to see that now of, of some of the kids starting to think of, you know, gold chains are nice, love them, have them. And, uh, that's great, but it, maybe it's uh, time to maybe diversify or think about what if I don't get drafted into the NFL or Major League Baseball or the NBA of 
hey, maybe now I can put this money to work and diversify. So I am seeing that starting to pick up and talking with a few uh, college athletes that they're really starting to think about it. And I find the ones that are typically thinking about franchising and business are ones that typically have a support system, either a a business manager or a parent that's kind of helping them. It's like, hey, go through my parents on this uh, yeah. this investment idea, and they'll help me. And and I do see the the nil where it could be, hey, I'm going to help out my older brother, or maybe getting a business for him, or a family member of looking at a franchise. While hey, they could run it while I'm still playing. And I think that's a really great idea because. You you could start your business now. Just start with one. Have a have a franchise uh, or, or in the business and have that generating that income. And then, depending on how quick, how fast your playing career is over, it's there for you. You always have that to fall back, and you can always build on that as you're playing. I'm going okay. Well, I made this level. I feel like I'm going to be playing for you know, two to three more years. Let me let me either get you know add on to that franchise, get another territory or get a new one. So I am starting to see that mindset and I'm kind of excited about that, that uh, someone that young would be thinking of, hey, let's get into business and, and let's uh, start with the uh, the franchise model. So I, I do see that it's just starting and ramping up. So I, I'm excited to see where where this leads. And, and I have been talking with you know a few of the uh, NIL athletes I, and, and hopefully get, get a few of them into a franchise for sure. That's awesome. And just to add, I think that could beautifully even diversify them later on, right? Because if they run the franchise even for five, six, or let's say 10 years, and then they decide to do something else, sometimes it can be a problem, especially if they want to uh, enter corporate world showcasing that business acumen. But now you were an athlete and you still were a business owner. So I think it diversifies your experience and persona to perhaps you might have more options later on, which path you want to take. Because again, you've kind of had some of the indirect, I would say, business degree, Mm -hmm. although I would say the more real life business degree from actually running that business and working on all that it entails to building a small business via the franchise option and whatever they choose for themselves, their focus to be. And so I want to dive actually before we finish a little bit more into the recruiting. How are you finding your athletes or what's the best way for athletes to find you? What's the best way if somebody listens to this for them to reach out and explore some of the conversations and options. Thank you. So I do find a, a lot of athletes that I start conversations on through LinkedIn. So um, I connect with a lot of athletes, LinkedIn, and we just, you know, take the uh, conversation from there uh, and, you know, to answer your question of how I do reach out. So LinkedIn's definitely one for the athletes for sure. And then I do um, uh, go to different athletic events, uh, charity events where athletes are going to be there and and we talk via either a golf tournament or, or or different things like that of networking events and and talk to athletes that way. Um, anybody athlete or, or a professional looking to get into the franchise world, you know, they can email me at james at the or uh, my website's the, the, you know, the Fran dream. Um, and uh, that it can be all the information's there of how to get a hold of me. And uh, it's all just simple conversations like we're having now. It's nothing like you got to do this. You know, it's, it's not used car salesman. So it's, it's all about finding the right fit and making, and just seeing if it's something that, that would be a match for you. Yeah. Thank you. I may email you a little bit later, James, because I need my my schedule to come down a little bit. But I've been pondering about franchise for a long time and I conquer. I've taken this call with you and had several conversations, obviously, before. And you're not like many of the other franchise people who reach out to me. So I appreciate your your perspective and again having that athlete mindset and focus on athletes. Actually on that note. You really seem like focus on the athletes. What attracts you to working with them? It goes back to when I first started in in, in uh, working in my career of when I was a, a franchise coach and and coaching uh, franchisees. Uh, when I would give a franchisee advice on how to correct or run their restaurant, 
that really made me feel really good because in the corporate world, if I'm telling someone how to do it in corporate, if they're like, they're getting paid to do a job and they're like, yeah, okay, James, whatever. Um, but with a franchisee, when I'm telling him how to, how to uh, maybe do something that's going to make his life a little bit easier, it impacts his life. It, it impacts his livelihood. It impacts, uh, you know, maybe having a little bit more time that he could spend at home or you know, maybe a little bit more profit. So it, it's impacting the, the lives of maybe changing something for the better of them. So for the non-athletes and even really the athletes too, working with people in into franchising, it's all about showing them options that are out there that potentially could really just change their life of where they make a life change and we find something, we find a great franchise fit for them and they do that. They're now um, an entrepreneur and it just changes their life and potentially could deliver a generational wealth for them. And that's why I do it. Excellent. And last question, uh, closing note, I typically ask my guests, I think right now it's very on point given what's going in the world, even in the United States, the elections coming up, we still have active wars going on. That's not helping the global economy. Looking at 2024 and sort of what's ahead, what are some of the key things, James, you would want to inspire people to be doing more of or less of? I really think uh, just in my journey and talking with everybody out, out there is that just, you know, bet on yourself, take that risk. And, and I'm not just talking business in general. I'm just talking, you know, take that risk, be yourself, step out of the box and just and just do something that you think you could have never done before. It, it, it will impact somebody's life. Maybe it's not in business or whatever, but just take that leap of faith because we all get in boxes and, you know, step out of the box and uh, you can change the world by stepping out of the box. You, you, you really can or change your life or somebody else's life. Gosh, I love that. Makes me think about so many options. Uh, fantastic advice. Thank you so much, James, for the conversation. I highly enjoyed it. I will add the links to the episode notes so people can easily click and find you or email you and connect. Conquer with LinkedIn, it's an awesome resource. So I just want to inspire more athletes or whoever's listening to this to use LinkedIn. It's my number one social network. I use Instagram for podcasts, but really LinkedIn is the one that I spent the most active time that I actually pay attention to. I conquer, I think, any athlete uh, listening to this, again, even who's young, trying to build that LinkedIn profile early on and create it, even if you have athletics and student athlete, I think it's super beneficial to start it early. Anything else, James, you want to close off with before we end on a late Sunday evening, actually, your time? I would just say um, thank you to you for having me on. I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, I just uh, wish you much success. And, and again, thank you for having me on. Thank you, James. I'll be reaching out and maybe we'll have a franchise conversation where you'll help me match with some fun business idea later on. Absolutely. Looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank you.